So in the last video, we saw how to check the legality of a program transformation, in that case, reversing a loop nest, by solving a set of linear inequalities that describe whether or not the transformation violates any data dependencies. But can this be done in general? Um, and the answer is yes. So first, I just want to spend a little bit of time on integer linear programming, which is the tool that we used last time to find a solution to a set of linear equations and inequalities. So the first step is, if we can set up linear equations and inequalities that describe whether dependencies in a program are violated, then we can solve them uh, predictably using uh, standard off-the-shelf math mathematical software for what's called integer linear programming, or ILP. So ILP solves, as I was saying, uh, expressions like the one you see down here, where it's some linear expression plus a constant greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to zero, or equal to zero. So for example, this whole thing is um, an integer linear program. Uh, this is another integer linear program. Find integers x, y, and z that satisfy 3x plus 4y plus z greater than or equal to zero, minus 3x minus 3 less than or equal to zero, and z plus 2x plus, or z plus 2 plus x equals zero. Um, this is not an ILP problem, right? If we have sine of x in here, that's a transcendental function. It's not linear, and so this is no longer an ILP. Um, minimizing and maximizing function subject, subject to constraints is an ILP, so find integers x, y, and z that minimize x plus y plus z subject to the constraints we looked at before uh, is an ILP. On the other hand, if we do 3x times y plus 4 times y plus z greater than or equal to 0 in the constraints, it's not an ILP because uh, x times y is not linear, right? It's not just a constant times a variable. It's constant times variable times variable. Um, and if you have quantifiers in the constraints, it's not an ILP problem. So if we add for all x greater than or equal to 0, x plus y is less than or equal to 1 to the constraints, suddenly that's also not an ILP. On the other hand, if we remove the quantifier, this is an ILP. So this mathematical basis for solving dependence analysis problems, which is used for all kinds of other things, is NP-complete. So basically, it's as hard as propositional SAT, which is very, very hard in theory. On the other hand, it's often tractable in practice. Oh, excuse me. For problems with hundreds uh, or thousands of variables. So it's a useful tool. Uh, and if we can reduce a problem about program analysis to integer linear programming, then uh, very often for modest size programs, it's going to be tractable. And it includes a lot more than you think. So the grammar that we described of basically just linear constraints sounds very limited. But actually, as I was saying, it's NP-complete, so you can express propositional logic. Uh, you can actually express uh, division by constants. You can express remainder. Um, and if you're willing to include or by basically calling the ILP solver multiple times, you can do things like min and max, and you can also go to absolute value comparisons and all sorts of other stuff. So the other issue about generalizing the technique we learned in the last video is what about multiple dimensions? So in the last video, the set of equations that we got and the program analysis problem that we were doing were based on um, a one-dimensional program transformation. Take uh, one for loop and ask whether it could be reordered. Uh, but how do we deal with the problem of uh, loops with multiple different uh, for loops or loop nests with multiple loop levels like the one we see on the left here? So in this case, we've got for i and 1 to 4, for j and 1 to 3, the statement is a of i j equals a of i minus 1 j plus 1. And if you want to think about the iteration domain or the set of statements in this program, instead of being a one-dimensional set uh, made up of points on a line, it's a two-dimensional set made up of uh, basically this rectangle of points in 2D with i from 1 to 4 and j from 1 to 3. So we now need to describe the schedule uh, before we can do our encoding and integer linear programming. And in our schedule, we're going to need to have multiple dimensions because there's multiple loop levels. But how are these schedules ordered? So when a schedule is one-dimensional, it's just obvious that uh, you know, in one-dimensional time, say you know, i is greater than j if the number i is greater than j in the conventional sense that we learn in algebra. Um, but how do you compare vectors? And if you're a more mathematically oriented person with some formal math background, you might know that there isn't actually a total order uh, in higher dimensions. And the answer is lexicographically. So we're going to use an ordering which is written normally using the double greater than and double less than sign. And it's that i comma j is lexicographically greater than i plus 3j minus 1 if and only if i is greater than i plus 3. So the first component is greater, uh, the first component on the left is greater than the first component on the right. Or i equals i plus 3 and j is greater than j minus 1. 
Um, and in our case, um, i is not greater than i plus 3, so this is false. And lexicographic order looks kind of weird when you write it in that symbolic form, but actually it's very familiar. It's basically the ordering you see on clocks. So for example, 1 comma 0 is lexicographically greater than 0 comma 9, for the same reason that 1 minute and 0 seconds is a larger amount of time than 0 minutes and 9 seconds. And of course, in general, here's just a repeat of that formula we saw on the last page. Now you might notice that there's an OR in here, and OR is not supported by integer linear programming. So if we have a formula that describes the data dependencies in a program and it includes lexicographic order, we're actually going to have to call the ILP solver multiple times to consider each possible branch in each OR. So uh, when you start encoding higher dimensional problems, you need more calls to an ILP solver um, in order to decide whether uh, the problem has a solution. So if we want to check if loop interchange is possible uh, in multiple dimensions, let's say we want to change from, you know, for i in 1 to 4, j in 1 to 3 do s, to for j in 1 to 3, for i in 1 to 4 do s. So our old schedule is sij happens at time i comma j. Our new schedule is sij happens at time j comma i. And whether or not this is lexicographic or legal reduces to the following system of constraints. Um, there's some i prime j prime that's lexicographically less than j prime j comma i, and i prime equals i plus one, and j prime equals j minus one, and i and j are in their respective domains. Um, and of course, because there's a larger set of constraints here, and because lexicographic order includes or, which means we're actually going to have to check multiple different ILP problems. Um, this gets a little bit tricky to solve, uh, so I just fed it into um, a solver, and it informed me that this is sat, which means that the transformation is illegal. So that's um, the outline of how you would check if a program transformation is legal, and I recognize that we went over some stuff pretty fast, um, but hopefully you got the general idea, which is you take in your proposed uh, orig your original program, your proposed program transformation, you compute schedules for each one, you compute the data dependencies for the original program based on the schedule and the memory accesses, and then you convert the expression which describes whether or not the new schedule violates any of those data dependencies into a system of uh, integer linear constraints, and then you solve those constraints. And if the constraints have a solution, that means there's some dependence that's violated and the transformation is illegal. And if there is no solution, that means all constraints are respected, and that means that you can do the transformation. So what if we want to find a program transformation from scratch? So what if instead of trying to check the legality of a proposed program transformation, we actually want to find a program transformation that improves our program in some way um, without explicitly specifying that transformation? Maybe we just want to say, oh, take in a program and make it have better locality or make it easier to parallelize while preserving its behavior. Um, how do we do that kind of thing? And that's actually something the polyhedral model can also do for you. And it's a more complicated topic that we'll address in the next video. So I'll see you then.